it might seem like interesting timing to take time right now and look at some of the martyrs uh, that have suffered greatly and lost their lives, uh, oftentimes for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of their faith. Why now? What makes this a time where maybe I would want to do a few episodes on this? Well, I think it's actually very timely because with everything being so difficult, uh, chaotic, and in turmoil right now, it is a time to reflect on what matters most. We might very realistically be faced sometimes with the question of what hill do I want to die on? And it might seem like a figure of speech, but ultimately that's a major test of what are we willing to defend? What are we willing to really stand for? These days, I think that's a big question because we're in a very divided country and that leaves us vulnerable. We're divided because when we remove God from the picture as our authority, then somebody else must fill that place. Some ideology, some person, some group, something has to always fill that void. So the question is very pertinent that what do we hold to? What do we adhere to? Or to whom do we adhere and give our loyalty? It's a big question to ask, but it's a very important one. It's really everything. The one thing that nobody can take from you is your belief. Most anything else can be taken away. And that's a harsh reality of this world. It's not fun to think about and to hear. And yet, it's actually a big source of healing for us. Because see, when we know what cannot be taken away, we hold less to the things that can be. They take a little bit of a back seat as they should. When our priorities with a laser focus are rock solid and in place, immovable, because they're based on truth that is immovable. And that's really what we want to do. Much of our suffering, much of our strife comes from not knowing what's the most important, not knowing which way to go, what to adhere to, what step to take, either for fear fear of failure or looking like a fool, maybe facing rejection, unnecessary pain and hardship. We have many choices to make in this life, and it's hard. It's not easy. It's not clear or simple. So I think looking at the martyrs offers some insight, some reminders to us that ultimately at the end of the day or at the end of our life, that putting the truth first is vital because when we're standing on what's true, it can take the test and we're willing to lay our life down for the truth because we believe in the truth giver. We believe in the one who established all that is true and our allegiance and loyalty really belongs to him. So really what else Should we give ourselves to? What else is worth devoting ourselves to? The best career, the best relationships even in this life. What are they all for? They can be good things, and I hope they are good things for you in your life. And yet, there's something deeper. There's something that transcends everything that this world has to offer and everybody that's in this world. Because everybody who walks with us in this life, this life, no matter what we do, is limited in its duration. So really, our vision extends beyond what this life holds into eternity. And all our relationships are rooted in something deeper, at least all the relationships that we, that we truly value. Wouldn't you agree that part of the reason they become so precious and valuable is because they, we can feel how deep they are? They're not something that this world offers. The world doesn't give you relationships. Those are something that's provided from God because God is the creator of of us. And so our relationship with each other, with ourselves and with God, if they all tie together in his order and his sequence and and us putting things in perspective according to his ways, this is life-giving. And ultimately, that's what we're seeking, I think. Not all of us. Some people don't. Some people don't self-reflect and don't seek wisdom and don't seek true life. That's just the way it is. That's the way it's always been. And there will be people who don't understand when you or I choose life and choose to adhere to what is true, noble, and wise, and eternal. It'll seem like a foreign language to them. Well, some people we might be able to share the truth with and persuade. Other people will not be reasonable. They won't be amenable to what is good and true. And they might even reject us for mentioning such things, maybe socially Maybe just giving us a look and moving on. Or maybe it can put our lives at stake. 
So what do we do with that? And that's why I wanted to look at just a few martyrs. I don't want to make it a a focus of obsession, an object to be adhered to too much. But there's such value, such preciousness in reminding ourselves of lives being laid down for what is true and what is good, which ultimately comes from God. And in many cases, it was people laying down their lives directly for God. Other times, it was less direct. For example, John the Baptist, he was a devout servant of Jesus. And even being Jesus's cousin, it's kind of amazing when I think about that. You know, if you, if you imagine how easy is it not to really fully respect somebody in our own families. Jesus did face that. He said a prophet is not without honor, except in his own home, his own town, with his own family, right? And he didn't do as many miracles because of the disbelief that occurred when he was around people that already had known him. People that could say, who is this little squirt, you know, running around as a kid before, and now he grows up and says he's God? Yeah, good luck with that. We know you. We know. We remember you growing up and, you know, you're claiming you have this eternal power, this this authority from God. Who do you think you are? We remember you when we could pick you up and put you over our knee. So they didn't sometimes believe him like they might. But not so with John the Baptist. He intimately got it. Even before either of them was born, when, <laughs> when John the Baptist's mom heard of the news and she was still pregnant with him. He leapt inside of her womb. Amazing, isn't it? So there was the spirit at work, even before birth. God can work in such mysterious ways that we have no idea. What a beautiful thing. And John would actually be faithful to that for his whole life, to the point of being baptizing people is incredible. Baptism pointing basically to us dying and being resurrected again before Jesus was ever crucified and before the resurrection took place. He lived a quiet life. People knew him later on, but he lived much a quiet life. And it seemed like he was okay with that. He made mention to that, that he's not the one that this is all pointing to, that it was about Jesus. So he quietly did his work. He would baptize lots of people, including Jesus. What an honor that would be. He didn't want to accept that at first, but Jesus insisted in a godly way that was the way things were to go. So so John the Baptist, Jesus' own cousin, actually got to baptize Jesus, who was sinless. What a picture. What what an amazing, beautiful picture of of servanthood, of love, of a bond, this life-giving relationship. Now, John was so loyal to the truth that he didn't make any qualms about pointing out what was good and what was true and and what wasn't. And this wasn't always seen favorably. We see this with King Herod the Tetrarch. He was ruler at the time, and when he married his brother's sister, that was not cool. That was not a thing that was supposed to uh, to have been done. Now, it wasn't like nobody knew that this was wrong. People knew it, but they didn't, Herod didn't want to hear it, and neither did Uh, Herodias, his wife, his brother's former wife. So they really didn't want to hear it to the point where Herod actually had John put in prison. He just wanted to get him out of his way. Herodias, well, she, she, uh, let's say, accentuated the situation a bit or a lot when at, at her birthday, she came to Herod and, and he said, hey, I'll give you whatever you want. You just name it. And, This probably lovely daughter of his, she said, uh, with the advice of her mom, she came up with this idea that, you know what I want? I want John's head on a platter. And we have this phrase to to this day, right? Oh, give me their head on a platter. And that's where it came from. A lot of phrases come from the Bible and we don't even know it. Or maybe you do know it, but there's many of those that can, that can just slip into our daily vernacular and they might have some rich history behind them coming from some roots that it's kind of nice to remember and to be connected with the origin of a lot of where these thoughts and and examples come from. So anyway, he did. He did not want to dishonor his word and to now contradict his own commitment because a promise is a promise and seen in front of friends and others where he had made this promise, Herod was in a bind. He didn't really want to behead 
John the Baptist. He wanted him to be silenced, but he didn't necessarily plan to behead him. But with the egging on from his daughter, uh, he decided to. And so, right then, he had John executed and his head brought to him on a platter. So now they could continue on with their plans, with their life together. They could finally have their way with things as if life was going to be good. Now, the point here that I'm really referring to in all this is John the Baptist's John the Baptist himself. John was martyred, and at first glance, it it might not be directly for Jesus, per se. It wasn't like he was standing for Jesus. John was misunderstood in a lot of ways, but he was always very clear himself on what he was standing for and with whom he was standing. He was mistaken at times. People thought, oh, maybe he was Elijah, but he was John. (laughs) And he was just being himself, serving God, living quietly, trying to, just following what the Lord would have him to do, following Jesus when Jesus came along, took this transition of the mantle of leadership, passing the baton to where now Jesus would be the one baptizing. And also there was others that would baptize too. It wasn't just John the Baptist and Jesus. Jesus would actually go on to have his disciples baptize many. And so when the leaders got upset with him for baptizing so many, they didn't even realize it at the time, but it was him and his disciples that were, that were doing it. John the Baptist, having been confused for who he was and what he stood for, pointed out a very simple truth. It was a truth that wasn't really a big secret, not to everyone anyway, but he was maybe the loudest voice. John was willing to stand for what was true, knowing that truth comes from God, especially God's law came from God. And people just don't always want to hear. What do we do when these people that don't want to hear have authority over us? Do we sit silently? Maybe sometimes. In John's example, he didn't. It doesn't mean that we all are to follow exactly to a T what his model was. But we need to be willing to, if that's what's before us, if that's where God places us. So it's not just about whether we live or die. It's about what we adhere to, being willing to die on a hill, when that hill is the truth. We need not to compromise. We need not to cower away from what's true. Here's a fact from the world. The world will never stop pushing on truth. If you cave in one area and you think that's okay, the world will push. It's like a constrictor snake. When it grabs its prey, it will surround it. It will wrap itself around it, but it won't necessarily crush it. It doesn't have to because it knows that that creature has to eventually exhale. And when it does, it will just constrict a little bit more and being unable to take another breath, it's not long before that creature silently passes away. And that's what the world tries to do. It encroaches on what is true. It challenges what's good. It rejects what it doesn't want to hear, and it's not going to have it. So at what point do we stand? At what point do we become unyielding? I maintain this. Much of our mental health has to do with us caving into what we already know is good, and we've let our boundaries slip. We've let things encroach into that which we know is good, and now we don't know how to step beyond it. We don't know how to inhale and be inspired. Inspiration, meaning the breathing in, which is also the life-giving nature. Like when God created Adam, he breathed into him the breath of life, and then it says that Adam became a living soul. It wasn't just when God created him and formed him from the dust of the earth. It was when he breathed into him his breath. That's what we need. We need to not only have respiration where we breathe, we need to have inspiration where we breathe in from the Lord's Spirit. And God has sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. Jesus sent the Comforter to be with us. And he told us he was going to do that. And he followed through just as he has with every promise he always delivers. That means that we need to use that strength to use that inner voice, which is really his voice speaking from his spirit to our spirit. And through our soul, we listen to that through a soul that's ready to obey and listen and follow the leading and the promptings of the spirit which is placed in us. If we don't, we're going to be tormented. If we do, we might be tormented by man. But if we don't, we're going to be tormented by God. And I'm not just referring to heaven and hell. I'm referring even to this life. If we don't honor that 
vision which he places within us, then we are committing ourselves to a tormentful path where we have one foot on each side of the fence, one foot in the world and one foot in heaven. And we can't live that way. We can't serve two masters. So the question becomes, what torment am I willing to put up with? We can have torment with peace, meaning that in my spirit I have peace because I know that I'm serving the Lord. And even though there's discomfort placed on me by others in this world who would have me pull away from the Lord and do what they think that I should do, which on some level is tormentful, but it's not enough to rob us of our eternal peace that transcends all understanding. That's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. God does give us the peace that transcends understanding, at least the world's understanding, because they try to figure things out. They pursue the path of pleasure, and they think that by pain, which is the opposite of pleasure, that they will conquer us, and they can't, because we have the indomitable spirit, which comes from God, and a deposit of the spirit is placed within us, each and every one of us who have allowed him to dwell within us, So that now we can follow his promptings and his leadings. And we have the word, the scriptures. We have others in our lives, hopefully, that can lead and challenge us. We need to follow these. If we don't, we are signing up for a deeper torment. And that is good because that torment is designed to alert us to the pain of not following his leadings. It's not meant to just be punishment. It's got a purpose. That's why he's equipped us to experience pain, to alert us that there is a threat. In our bodies, it can be that physical pain is caused because something is threatening our physical safety. Maybe it's causing injury, disease, whatever. Within our person, there are many more kinds of pain that can exist too, to point us to something that might be a threat. What do we do with that? We respond in a self-compassionate way, honoring the truth that's within us to say, how might I preserve the truth itself from being threatened? Because if I connect with the truth and the one who is true, and he holds the ultimate path and the ultimate say of what's going to happen with my soul, with my spirit, then I'm going to return to him when this is all over. And nobody and nothing from this earth can keep that from happening. Therefore, he's the one who has my allegiance. And that's how loyal John was. He knew that the law came from God, and he was going to stand because he knew people who willingly break the law have a godless heart. So his way of pointing to the Father was by pointing to the truth that came from the Father. He had many times of preaching. I don't know how preachy he was in that moment, if he was directly telling people, uh, including Herod, about that this is disobedience to God. But Herod knew it. When we tell people what is good and they don't want to receive it, fine. We don't need to beg them to receive the truth. We don't also need to be afraid of those who reject the truth. Instead, let's fear the Lord who has command over the destiny of our eternity. And when we have that in place, then we become unshakable. And when we look at the martyrs, that's a common thread. Now, there are sometimes conflicting stories about what really happened with the different martyrs. But this one we have a biblical example of. And it might be said, well, was John the Baptist really a martyr because he wasn't standing for Jesus? And... In this case, it wasn't necessarily just because of his belief in Jesus that was the formal reason that he was killed. But it was for the God who, since Jesus came from the Father, openly said that, John was allying himself with, with the law. I won't belabor the point with that. It's, it's pretty clear. So now, what do we do with this truth? We stand on it. We stand on the truth. We stand fully persuaded and convinced that the author of the truth is good and he's the only one worthy of our allegiance and our service. And so we stand strong for him. We don't need just to be strong within our own strength because the truth is truth, whether we stand for it or not. And we can all have moments of doubt. Peter, who was definitely a diehard for Jesus, ran when confronted. Didn't you know this one who they're crucifying? No, 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 I didn't know them. And he he betrayed Jesus three times, just like Jesus had, had prophesied. But then Peter became very strong after the resurrection, too, and was very prominent, basically the founder of the church, right? He's the one who Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Powerful. And the name Peter, Petra, rock, from the Greek. So we can see these these threads woven in. My point is this. As we look at these martyrs, these are wonderful examples of service, of devotion, of wholeheartedness. 
even though we still lack, we still have our failings. Sure, of course we do. We're limited. We're human. But let's still go back to a place of standing strong for Jesus every time. You'll hear me sometimes refer to what I call the golden question, which is, what then shall I do? What then shall I do with my faith? Live it fully. What then shall I do with my knowledge of God? Know more. Know him. Learn. Discover. Speak about him. When we are on the path acting on what he's prompted us to do, we have peace because the distance between us and God and the friction and the resistance against him will cause pain. If we alleviate that pain first and foremost, then we clear the way so that we can now receive the peace that comes from him. The reason that we don't have peace is because something stands in the way. And oftentimes it's our own either ignorance or resistance. So we remedy that by seeking him. When we seek him with our whole heart, we will find him. Jesus didn't just say, I speak the truth. I am the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. So we're not just learning and knowing information. We are seeking the one who truth comes from and who the law comes from. And we are willing to die on that hill because to do otherwise would be to deny the truth. It wouldn't be my place to command anyone to be willing to die for God. It's not a command. It's something that I desire for us myself and for you to come to a place where if push comes to shove, because it may, it may already be beginning. My desire and my prayer for us is to come to a place where we wouldn't have it any other way, where when we look at the truth, we say, absolutely, that's the truth. Now, who knows how we're going to react when a moment comes and what it will be like, but let our desire be to reach that place where we can say, I'm a hundred percent in. I do stand for the truth. Nothing is more important to me. I value it. I treasure it. And I love the one where the truth comes from, the one who has created the universe. And I want to return to him and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. When we consider the other traumas that we've been through, we know we're going to be healed from those in eternity. So why not allow more and more of his healing presence to come into our lives now? And when we feel the pain, when we feel the trauma, okay, turn to him, welcome his presence to be there with us through the pain. Because no matter what we go through, it won't pull us away from him. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So even our own weaknesses, even our own panic, trauma responses, I believe he wants us to be delivered from those. I believe he wants that for you. And he's also with you when they do happen. So we don't need to fear them. We don't need to. We don't need to fear anything that would attempt to pull us away from him. There's waves of doubt we can go through or waves of discomfort, waves of persecution. But ultimately, when we know that our foundation is in him, anything that would distract us from that is merely temporary, short-lived. And knowing that gives us a security that nothing in this world can ever give. And that is what I want to see for you. I pray for your healing, for your continued pressing into the Lord. Let everything draw you closer to him. Don't let it draw you away. If you hurt more, then run more into his arms. If this world dishes out a lot to you, then put that into the arms of Jesus. Continually, daily, moment by moment, ask, seek, and knock. This is the process that we go through. So let us devote each day, each moment to living for the Lord, however that looks in your life. And if we're not sure, run to him. Seek the support of others who do the same. Do this together. That's the church. These are my prayers for you. God bless you. I wish all the best for you. My prayers and hopes are that you would continually find fulfillment in his presence and that nothing else would come in the way of that.